Community members came together on the quad to end violence around the world. Then, East Campus is buzzing to increase JMU's biodiversity. Plus, softball hits off its home opener live on Breeze TV. Live from the Allison B. Parker Studio in the School of Media Arts and Design at James Madison University, this is Breeze TV. Welcome back to Breeze TV. I'm Maggie Rickerby. And I'm Zoe Mowry. Students and community members came together on the quad Monday to speak out against global conflict. The protest was organized through an Instagram account calling to free Palestine, Congo, and the Dominican Republic. I spoke with people on the quad about their ongoing message. About two dozen people could be heard chanting on the quad Monday afternoon. Palestine will be free! Their mission, a ceasefire in Gaza and an end to violence around the globe. One of the voices belongs to a local advocate and church pastor with family ties in the Congo. Once we say something about something that is not working properly, or we decry some actions that are happening, that can bring a change, a big change in the world, not only in our places as we live here in a little tiny city of Harrisonburg. This call for change was organized by students. Professor Bruce Bushing says students have been at the forefront of many successful movements, like civil and women's rights. It's completely appropriate that students be leading in this way. They are studying these things. They have a certain amount of freedom that people who have jobs don't have. And uh, to waste that is neglecting their responsibility. Following behind the students is Ziada Manu's daughter, nine-year-old Rosie. As a young advocate, she accompanies her father to stand up against violence. It makes me feel good to be standing up for the people, my people. This fight for peace didn't end on the quad. Friendly City for Palestine could be found protesting outside the city council meeting on Tuesday. The group continues to call for a ceasefire resolution in Palestine and advocate for other international issues. Conflict continues to pervade in both the Congo and Gaza. In the Congo, the Human Rights Watch World Report says more than 120 armed groups potentially violated international law by participating in war crimes. It all stems from martial law being declared in the eastern part of the country. More than 2,000 people were killed in the country's eastern provinces. The military rule in eastern Congo has displaced more than 5 million people. Meanwhile, the death toll in Israel and Palestine continued to climb. The United Nations says nearly 1,500 Israelis and more than 27,000 Palestinians have been killed. This comes after the October attacks from Hamas militants at an, in, at an Israeli music festival late last year. The World Health Organization says Israeli Defense Force airstrikes in Gaza have resulted in a lack of medical supplies in the contested area. The lack of water, food, and fuel in Gaza is depleting the health, health system there. Looking forward to filing your taxes? I didn't think so. Luckily, there's a service on campus that offers tax help to low-income community members. Breeze TV's Jack Hadley and Andrew Perkson spoke with volunteers to learn more about the program. JMU's Volunteer Income Tax Assistance is a program that helps members of the community with their annual tax returns. Student volunteers within the College of Business assist on the returns and then a business professor reviews them. Volunteer Taylor Locke says the price is what sets Vita apart from other tax return services. Some companies or tax accountants will charge $200 to fill out an annual tax return and they may not have the funds or necessarily want to spend that money and here it's free for them and we provide the same service. The coordinator of VITA, Irina Scott, says VITA is also important for business students to gain practical experience. We also build a relationship with the community between the students and the community. The students are talking to the taxpayers and they're learning how to uh, provide a service also. So when they go to work, they'll know that providing a service to communities is a good idea. Taxes are a challenging topic and a lot of people don't enjoy doing them. So I think it's like good for us who like are capable to do, or understand it easier and have learned about it in our classes here to help others who don't necessarily know the same things. Help from VITA is available by appointment. The program runs through February and March on Friday evenings, except during spring break. It will also be available in the morning on March 23rd and April 6th. 
This is Jack Hadley reporting for Breeze TV. High-speed internet is something many of us are used to, but for people in rural areas, it's considered a luxury. News director Kayla Brown has more on Augusta's struggle for internet. Kayla? Thanks, Zoe. People in Augusta County are tired of waiting for broadband. It's been seven years since the county began its fight to bring broadband internet to pockets without service. At the start of 2024, the county still has to lay 650 miles of fiber optic cable to bring internet to remote homes. I met with a community member who showed me the fiber optic cable boxes in his yard. While they're in place, high speed internet is still a ways away. This is Augusta County. Divided by mountains, rivers, and streams, Brian Scovera moved to the valley more than a decade ago. The Baltimore native was looking for peace and quiet. He found it, but with a catch. He has no internet. We live out in the sticks that we don't have a lot of the same um, options that folks do in the city. The county's unique terrain and out-of-date telecommunications infrastructure makes it difficult to lay fiber optic cable. The Scoviras pay $175 a month for Dish Network. With their current plan, they only get one hour of streaming a month. I like the Great British Baking Show, but I just keep taking out DVDs at the library and watching the old ones. That's because if Elena watches just one episode, she can't check her email for the rest of the month. The county established a broadband committee in 2018, but internet providers have made little progress. Providers chase return on investment. So it's very hard to build to the rural areas, and therefore, why would they if they weren't going to be able to make money back? That's when the county partnered with smaller providers, such as Bark Electric Cooperative. The hope is the smaller ISPs would fill the gaps left by bigger providers. But after two years, nothing. It just seems crazy in 2024, especially working in a library field where you see the technology constantly changing, constantly updating. It's sort of defeating when it's been years in the making and we've seen them out there working and just it doesn't seem any closer. People hear it's coming, it's coming, and they don't really wrap their head around how much effort goes into it. Augusta County partnered with the All Points Broadband Project in 2022 with the goal to bring service to over 90% of houses without broadband by 2025. In the meantime, the Scoveras will just have to stick with what they know. For me, I like the peace and quiet. No, I don't, I don't mind the sacrifice. I kind of like it. The Scoviras have considered switching from DISH to Elon Musk's Starlink for their internet service, a switch that could cost $600 up front, but would bring unlimited data to their home. At such a high price point, how many, many in the community can't turn to Starlink? Breeze TV will have more in the weeks to come. Maggie and Zoe, back to you. Thanks, Kayla. Virginia traffic law enforcement was out on I-81 in higher numbers than normal on Monday and Tuesday. This was for their disrupt campaign meant to stop reckless driving behavior. According to Virginia Police Public Relations, state troopers arrested five drivers for DUI slash DUID charges and 10 drivers for drug charges during the two-day period. They also issued 343 speeding tickets and 36 tickets for reckless driving. They gave 60 citations for seatbelt violations, 70 citations for equipment violations, 215 tickets for inspection sticker violations, and 46 citations for operator's license violations. According to Virginia Police, these numbers are higher than average. Difficulties in the classroom are more common than one may think. Though National Disability Week isn't until March, JMU's Office of Disability Services is aiming to make sure no student struggles alone. Preparations for Disability Advocacy Week are kicking off in JMU's ODS office, located on the first floor of the SSC, to bring attention to facilities offered by ODS. It's really just making students aware that we're here, there are resources available, and you don't just have to struggle through on your own or try to figure out how to self-accommodate um, because we're here to support students in doing that. For all kinds of physical and learning disabilities, ODS said they want to encourage students to reach out if they feel they may qualify for accommodations. Well, coming up next, grab your coffee cup because this change has turned seven with a whole lot of celebration. Then who let the dogs in the library? This program did just that. Plus, the cup craze that caused fights in stores is now under fire for possible lead exposure and how it could affect JMU students. You don't want to miss what we've got coming up on Breeze TV.
and it's bow time. A leg and thigh dinner from Bojangles for just $5.99? That's a New Year's resolution. Probably won't last long. Kinda like mine. Get more flavor this year with a boldly seasoned leg and thigh, choice of fixin' and a biscuit for $5.99. And it's bow time. And it's bow time. Dude, we need gas. No, we gotta get those Supremes. We're not gonna make it. It's bow time, baby. So worth it, right? I'm glad y'all ran out of gas. Boldly seasoned chicken Supremes with a biscuit, fixin' and drink. And it's bow time. <laughs> It's bow time. Bojangles' new chicken rice bowl starts with dirty rice, topped with Cajun pintos, chicken, and cheese. How's that chicken rice bowl? It's bold from the bottom up. Get a fresh, hearty chicken rice bowl for a limited time. It's bow time. It's bow time. Hurry into Bojangles for two scratch-made sizzling sausage biscuits for just four bucks. One bite, and you'll want breakfast for dinner. Good thing we serve savory sausage biscuits all day. But this two-for-four deal won't last forever. It's bow time. This is Breeze TV. Breeze TV's Eric Shellhouse is in studio with a story that might just be the bee's knees. Eric? Thanks. OEJMU is the first university to earn Virginia's Pollinator Smart Certification for the East Campus Pollinator Garden. As the university continues to grow, local advocates are making sure the valley's natural systems aren't getting lost in the process. Breeze TV's Sam Game and I spoke with pollinator advocates in Harrisonburg to see what the buzz is all about. Tom Knapp has dedicated his life to teaching about bees and their importance to the world around us. He's even curated the perfect slideshow to present at local schools. That's kind of a cool picture, right? You know, people, we got to take care of our bees, right? That kind of thing. But for him, the education doesn't stop at grade school. Someone I uh, near and dear to my heart said, when you quit learning, you started the process of dying already. So for us as a community that uh, embraces JMU, uh, JMU's involvement uh, has been actually quite good. Despite Knapp's praise, some pollinator advocates are concerned about the university's environmental impact. In order to like construct this big university, they've had to cut down native like wild areas, like places where there's native plants which provide a great home for pollinators, stuff's built on it, or they replace it with grass which causes a tremendous amount of uh, biodiversity to disappear. By sourcing local plants and greenery, Wagley says JMU can do their part in saving all kinds of species native to the valley. There's other um, native pollinators that are really fa like really close to facing extinction and there are some other bumblebees that have already gone extinct um, just in the past 20 years. That's why advocates are working with Bee Campus USA to promote a diverse habitat garden on East Campus. In the 20 years Professor Wayne Teal spent overseeing the garden, he says he's seen major improvement. And you'll get an increase in pollinators, you'll get an increase in, in insects that, that eat, the, eat those specific plants, but you'll also get an increase in predators, increase in spiders, increase in birds. And so it's a cascade of improvements in terms of biodiversity. While these strides may seem small, to this pollinator loving brood, preserving natural systems in the valley isn't just imperative, but sweet like honey. Reporting for Breeze TV, I'm Eric Shellhouse. Breeze TV's Madeline Bynack is in studio to let us know what kind of weather these pollinators will be facing this weekend. Madeline? Thanks, Eric. This Friday, we see highs around the 50s, lows ranging from mid-30s into the 40s, and those light flurries tonight have turned into a full-blown winter weather advisory. The Harrisonburg area expects four to six inches of snow, and students are advised to stay indoors. That snow will cause Saturday's temperatures to drop, so you might want to get out your winter coats. Temperatures hovering in the low 20s and the lower temperatures are going to be found in the winter green and Waynesboro area getting as cold as 14 degrees. Thank you. Thankfully, wind speeds don't get much higher than three miles per hour, so it shouldn't feel much colder than that. Sunday picks up, but not much. Highs are looking like upper 30s and mid 40s. Franklin and Broadway are gonna be getting those higher 40s. Areas closer to Woodstock and Winchester will be getting more of the mid 30s. 
Lows ranging in the higher 20s for the entire Rockingham area. So all those hoping for an early spring might have to wait until later this week. That's all for weekend's weather. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Madeline. Students lined up around the block to celebrate Seven Brew's seventh birthday on Wednesday. Seven Brew arrived in Harrisonburg this past November and has quickly become a favorite among students. To celebrate its anniversary, the stand offered free small drinks to customers from 7 to 8 p.m. as a way of saying thank you to the community. I would say a lot of our customer base is JMU students. Um, we definitely tell a difference on like breaks when they're not here. Um, it ve they're very much impacts us, so I would say probably 80% of our customer base is JMU students. Seven Brew also released a brand new sticker, a popular tradition the company uses to commemorate special days. They will also celebrate National Kindness Day on February 17th with an additional sticker launch. In this week's copy of The Breeze, you can read more on Seven Brew's impact on the community. Do you have a little one learning to read? Well, if you do, take them on to downtown Harrisonburg where they can learn with the company of a furry friend. Breeze TV's Zeta Seth spoke with man's best friend on how the program is helping the youth in the Berg. Mine is Chimelight and Starlight. Whoa. The Massanutten Regional Library hosts dogs to read to every Thursday in an effort to help local children learn to read. This is a program that many libraries do nationwide um, for new and emerging readers as they build their confidence and their reading skills, it's important for them to feel at ease. And so sometimes reading to an animal is a lot easier for a child than reading to a classmate or their teacher or even to a parent. The program brings children and a fuzzy companion together for quality reading time. He's like fun to read to and he's nice and it, I like his soft fur and stuff. Kathy McCarty, Gus's owner, says Gus has always loved children and when he became certified as a therapy dog, she jumped at the opportunity to participate in the program. They become much more relaxed the more they come and visit and read with us. Um, they also just enjoy being with Gus, and uh, I think that helps. Uh, if I'd have had that when I was a kid, I think reading would have been so much easier for me. I'm really uh, super pleased to have this opportunity uh, for Gus and I to come to the library. It really is a, uh, a wonderful experience for us. As for Gus... Reporting for Breeze TV, I'm Zeta Suttoth. You've seen them, you probably have one. The popular Stanley Cups are everywhere. Water bottles that took the JMU's campus by storm were recently found positive for lead in home tests. In a statement, Stanley said that while they do use some lead in the manufacturing process, there is no threat to consumers as long as the cup remains intact. If you're worried about potential lead risk, JMU Health Sciences professor Catherine Zeman shares tips for students. You can go to your doctor, you're concerned, you have a Stanley Cup and the button fell off, you didn't realize it, you've been using it for a while and you're concerned. They, they can check those enzyme levels and if there are subtle alterations in three key enzymes associated with red blood cell production, they might look further. Um, but as far as like some of the really visible signs of uh, lead exposure that a person could just see, you're going to be having a lot of other major problems before you can see that. Lead usage is regulated by the federal government, but can be still used in the manufacturing process. Health officials recommend talking to your doctor if you're concerned. Coming up today on the sports desk. Basketball completed one of its two doubleheaders this week, but how will they keep the momentum moving forward? Then lacrosse is ranked third in the nation and defeated their Commonwealth foe. Plus, baseball is back. Breeze TV's Tommy Gorganis has everything you need to know about the team. Stay tuned for more with Breeze TV Sports. It's bow time. A leg and thigh dinner from Bojangles for just $5.99. A leg and thigh dinner from Bojangles for just $5.99. A deal so good it's worth repeating, but it won't last long. So much flavor. Eat and repeat while it lasts. So much flavor. It's bow time. It's bow time. It takes 49 steps to bake a fluffy, made-from-scratch Bojangles biscuit. But to make it a country ham biscuit, it takes 50. Get a fresh buttermilk biscuit today with a slice of juicy, country-style ham. It's bow time.
it's bow time. Bojangles' new chicken rice bowl starts with dirty rice, topped with Cajun Pinto's chicken and cheese. How's that chicken rice bowl? It's bold from the bottom up. Get a fresh, hearty chicken rice bowl for a limited time. It's bow time. It's bow time. <laughs> Hurry into Bojangles for two scratch-made sizzling sausage biscuits for just four bucks. One bite, and you'll want breakfast for dinner. Good thing we serve savory sausage biscuits all day. But this two-for-four deal won't last forever. It's bow time. <laughs> Welcome back to the Sports Desk, your source for all things JMU Sports. I'm Colby Reese. Softball is back in the Berg this weekend for its season home opener. The Dukes are coming off a 4-1 start from the River City leadoff. After defeating Ball State, Jacksonville, and North Florida throughout last weekend, the team fell to conference rival Southern Miss. After a promising start to the season, the team is ready to channel what they learned in Florida through the rest of their schedule. We left too many runners on base, and, and the team knows that. Um, and I think the mindset needs to be, you know, don't make the situation more than it is. Like, just concentrate on having a good at-bat and barreling up balls in those situations. Freshman pitcher Kirsten Fleet had her season debut with a 0.51 ERA and looks to improve her play. So I think building on each day and making sure we're getting a little bit better each day and making the small adjustments. Sophomore catcher Bella Hensler says although this past weekend was not a sweep, the energy gained from those games will carry into the group's home opener. Still going 4-1, and one, having that momentum to come into playing at home, I think it's going to be really huge for us. Focusing on their offensive synergy, the Dukes will play in the Wheeler Orthodontics Invitational this weekend. We have to play sharp, and when there is a mistake made, we have to be able to recover very fast. We can't let things get contagious against teams like that. Just being able to find barrels at the right time and how we can string hits together. Using our staff effectively is going to be really good for us. Reporting from the Bank of the James Field at Veterans Memorial Park alongside Piper Hepler, I'm Sam Reinard. Earlier today, softball took on Villanova in its home opener, winning 8-5 to in a thrilling ending. The Dukes led off the scoring with a three-run first inning, but Villanova fired back with three of their own in the top of the second. JMU regained the lead in the bottom of the fourth with a KK Mathis single. Villanova once again had an answer with a two-run, two-out go-ahead home run in the sixth. Trailing 5-4 to four, entering the final frame, the Dukes quit, quickly loaded the bases. With one out, sophomore catcher Bella Hensler delivered a walk-off grand slam to give JMU their first home victory of the season, 8-5. Now at a record of 5-1 with their earlier win, the team is taking on Lehigh in their second game of the day. The Dukes currently leading by a score of 8-1 in the bottom of the sixth inning. The Atlantic Union Bank Center hosted a doubleheader Thursday night. The women's team was up first and wore pink for their annual Play for K game. The Dukes' opponent was Georgia State, and JMU was defeated by the Panthers 73-62. The group was without redshirt junior center Ksenia Kozlova, and Alicia Goodman replaced her in the starting lineup and put up 9 points. Peyton McDaniel had a big game with 21 points. However, Georgia State used Makayla Tolliver's 20 points and Maya Williams' 15 points to push past the Dukes. The Panthers out-rebounded JMU 48-37. Looking forward to Saturday, James Madison will have its final home game of the season. Losing on senior day last year still doesn't sit right with some on the team. This season, they'll hope to send their seniors out with one final home win. Last year, we played Marshall here at home on senior night, and we lost. So it's a, it's a bad feeling, especially for our seniors. So for our seniors, we want to really do a good job for them and make sure we're doing everything the right way so we get the dub. Use game tomorrow is against Coastal Carolina, and tip-off is at 2 p.m. In Game 2 of the doubleheader Thursday night, men's basketball also hosted Georgia State and beat the Panthers 83-63, breaking the program record for regular season wins. The Dukes started off strong in the first half, going on a 17-point run right off the bat. Terrence Edwards Jr. led in scoring with 28 points, and T.J. Bickerstaff put up 21. Despite their strong start, the team couldn't keep their foot on the gas the entire game, letting the Panthers slip through during the second half. The guys know the mistakes we made, what we did right, and we're going to move on quickly. Um, a lot of times you hear coaches say that after a loss, but I, I just don't think we were as sharp as we needed to be, and there's no reason we got to beat the guys up. They know what, what was right, what was wrong. After last night's win, the team is focused on lacing up at home one more time this season. It's our last chance to play in this arena um, this year, and 
you know, I, I really hope the fans come out and the students come out and, and support this team. And you will face off against the Georgia Southern Eagles this Saturday. Tip off is at 6 p.m. It's now time for this week's loop around the sun. Starting here with the women's side of things, looking at the top half of the standings, Marshall is two games ahead of Troy for that first place spot with only that one loss. ODU, JMU, and Georgia State, though, all sit at 9-4, and four, so very close there. And first through four receive an automatic bid into the quarterfinals, so those top four spots very prized. And moving on to the men's standings, App State is still in first, only those two losses, but JMU and Troy sitting at 10-3 and three, right behind the Mountaineers. And Southern Miss, Arkansas State, and Marshall all sit at 7-6. and six. And that's all for this week's Loop Around the Sun. For more on the world of sports, Breeze TV's Tommy Gerganis is in studio. Tommy? Thank you, Colby. Jamie Lacrosse has started the year at 2-0 with their most recent victory coming against Virginia Tech. This was the 21st te time both programs have squared off, further stoking the flames of a growing rivalry. Lacrosse secured its 20th all-time win against Virginia Tech by defeating the Hokies 17-5 Wednesday evening. Virginia Tech's only win against the Dukes came in 2022, and JMU says they were ready for another tight game. Tech has always been a, a challenge for us. We always talk about how it's a, a huge in-state rivalry. Any like school that we play that's from Virginia, it's always a close game. and We always know it's going to be a dogfight. The Dukes got off to a fast start against their in-state rivals and held a 7-0 lead after one quarter. JMU did not surrender a goal until 3 minutes and 40 seconds into the second quarter. The halftime lead for JMU was 12-2, and their lead grew to as many as 13 goals on their way to the victory. After a seven-goal game against UNC last Saturday, Maddie Epke was limited to zero goals and one assist. However, with Isabella Peterson, Casey Noblock, and Caitlin Morgan putting up hat tricks, the Dukes adjusted to a different kind of opponent. Just trying to use our personnel as needed, and today we just wanted to focus in on the draw, you know, see if we could have some other people step up and score, and that's what we got out of our team today. The team also considered the result a job well done coming off of their big game last weekend. We talked a lot about not like dropping off after UNC and trying to be consistent instead of like playing to other people's talents levels. The Dukes will have their next matchup this Saturday against number 24 ranked UConn, which will be played in Sparks, Maryland. Baseball is beginning its 56 game regular season schedule today against third ranked Arkansas on the road. Here's a look into how the team feels about their prospects for the year ahead. JMU Baseball finished 7th in the regular season standings and won a Sunbelt Conference Tournament game in 2023. This year, the team is projected to finish 10th in conference play. Even so, this doesn't change their higher expectations for year two. Last year, we went into the Sunbelt thinking, like, with a lot of questions, we weren't really sure the difference between the CA and Sunbelt, but now that we have one season under our belt, we answered those questions and we're all just super excited to get it started. The Dukes lost several of their most productive hitters to graduation. But with a strong mix of underclassmen and experienced players, the team believes they can still put runs on the board. And a lot of younger guys that are going to step up, a lot of returning guys also that are going to fill their roles uh, the right way. JMU's pitching staff has maintained several experienced arms and have been working towards improving on last year's results. In 2023, the team's earned run average of 6.20 ranked 7th of 14 Sunbelt teams. We're returning pretty much everybody that threw a lot of innings for us last year. So I, uh, with the addition of Travis to the new pitching coach, I think it's going to be great. We're going to just be better than we were last year. The Dukes opened up the season with a four-game series on the road against Arkansas. The Razorbacks are ranked number three in the 2024 D1 Baseball preseason top 25 rankings. JMU is prioritizing steady play in order to come out with wins on the road. Well, it comes down to pitching and defense. You know, you play a team like that, you got to minimize your mistakes and, and really capitalize on their mistakes. I think we're not looking past anything. You know, they're a great SEC team. And I think what we do on the field, we're just working for one game at a time. Baseball is currently taking on the Razorbacks in the middle of the third inning. JMU trails by a score of 4-3, to three, but struck first with a three-run homer from Fenwick Trimble in the top of the first. That's all from the world of sports this week. Zoe and Maggie, back to you. Thanks, Tommy. It's only six days until Giving Day 2024. The Breeze is counting on you to help us reach our goal of raising $10,000 next Thursday, February 22nd. Support from our donors gives our team of student journalists more opportunities to travel, buy new equipment, and improve our multimedia coverage, and so much more. 
Make sure to follow us on social media as we count down to Giving Day. Thank you for your support. Yes, thank you for your support and thank you for watching. We'll see you guys here, same time, same place, next week.